A thoughtful fan on my Discord, shout out to Low Base, requested ghost stories for a future episode, and I thought, what the heck, it's been a while. So, today's episode is full of paranormal activity that will make you step lightly in the dark and pray that the figures you see in the corner of your eye are just your imagination. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and I want to narrate your scary stories of the unexplained. So send them to me at darkstories.org. If you want to hear more scary stories, go to eeriecast.com or look for EerieCast on your favorite podcast app. And if you want a link to my Discord, it's in the description. Now, let's begin. Demonic Attachment from Proud Fenian Warrior I live in Glasgow in Scotland. There's an abandoned hospital near where I grew up, called Provenhall Hospital. Behind it, there's an isolated trail that the locals call The Haunted because of things that have happened there, or should I say, allegedly happened. There's a grave with a headstone where someone had their dead pit bull buried, and there are stories of teenagers in the 80s using the place for devil worship, which supposedly included animal sacrifice. It's quite a pretty place though, with lots of wildlife, and despite being in the middle of a housing estate, once you're just a few feet along the trail, it's very isolated. I was 23 years old. I decided to take a few sandwiches and go for a walk through The Haunted for a bit of peace and tranquility. It was a beautiful and sunny day, and I was walking at a nice, leisurely pace, taking in the scenery and enjoying the weather. After walking for about an hour, I decided to stop for a rest, eating my lunch next to the lock. I just sat down when I suddenly felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I couldn't explain it. I was on my own, except for what appeared to be a cow at the other side of the lock, from where I was sitting, drinking from the water. I couldn't explain why it made me feel so uneasy, until the thing I'd taken for a cow suddenly stood up on its hind legs, and I found myself staring at a pure black figure standing about seven feet tall with glowing red eyes. It looked like it was wearing a long flowing black robe with a hood. I sat there, frozen in absolute terror for a few minutes. Then I left my stuff behind as I ran as fast as I could back the way I came. As I ran, a strong wind came out of nowhere and it felt like it was chasing me. I did not stop running until I was safely back home. That night, I experienced sleep paralysis for the first time in my life. I couldn't move at all, nor could I make a sound. Then I saw it. Standing at my bedroom door was the same dark figure, which I can only describe as some kind of demonic entity. This episode lasted for about five minutes before I was able to snap out of it. When I got up the next morning, I found that every crucifix and statue of Jesus in the house had been pulled from the walls or knocked off of whatever surface it was sitting on. For the next five nights, the same thing happened, except as the nights went on, the thing drew closer and closer to me. Then in the morning, I would find my holy relics on the floor. On the sixth night, when I once again found myself in sleep paralysis, that thing was standing right over me, its cold hands around my neck, choking me. I could not breathe, and I genuinely thought I was going to die. I did the only thing I could think of, which was to say the Lord's Prayer in my head. It worked, and I jerked upright, but my neck was still sore. When I looked in the mirror, there were clearly bruises in the shape of fingers around my throat. The next morning, I phoned my uncle who was a Catholic priest and I told him what I'd been experiencing. He came up and blessed the whole house. Thankfully after that, everything went back to normal. The 
The Humming Lady From Lunar Prophecy This happened eight years ago. I'm a female and was pregnant at the time. Seven months, to be exact. We lived in a small town, and since my husband was always working, I went to a majority of my prenatal appointments on my own. I had to drive to the next town, which was about an hour and 50 minutes away from my appointment. I didn't mind the drive, and I took the opportunity to see my family every time I went back there. On that day, I decided to go visit my aunt. She stayed in the house I grew up in. She inherited the house when my grandmother passed away, and my aunt lived there alone. The house was in the countryside, maybe a few miles from the nearest small town. This house had always been a place for paranormal and unexplained activity. I have quite a lot of other stories about living there and unexplained things happening there as well. This one, though, stands above the rest. It is the creepiest thing that has ever happened to me while staying there. At around 4 p.m., when I arrived at my aunt's place, she told me to make myself at home, that she had to run to the grocery store real quick and also run a few errands. Okay, I said, and agreed to make myself comfortable. So I took a shower and relaxed. Since my appointment was on the following day, I wanted to try and rest. My aunt always locked all of the windows and doors despite living out of town. There were still a few close neighbors, and she did not like the idea of unlocked doors. She didn't have any pets, and at the time she had no security system. After my aunt left, I unpacked my suitcase and got some clothing laid out for my shower. I also grabbed my phone charger and plugged in my cell phone as the battery was almost dead. That was when I heard what sounded like someone talking in the entryway of the side door. It sounded like two little girls or younger girls. I couldn't make out what they were saying, but I heard laughter. Curious, I decided to check if my aunt had left the window open. I went to look, but there was no one there, and the windows and doors had all been locked and shut. I thought, that's strange. Maybe it was the neighbors or someone passing by. I looked out all the windows facing the woods, road, and in the direction of the neighbors. But again, I saw nothing. All the talking stopped while I was doing this. I shrugged. I couldn't explain that, and I was way too exhausted to care anymore. I grabbed some towels from the closet, but then I heard the voices again. Annoyed, I peeked around the corner, and I called out, saying, Hello? Again, nothing. Now I was getting a bit creeped out, so I went around, checking again. No one was there. So I decided to go on with my business. I grabbed my towels and got into a warm shower. The water felt great, and I had some shampoo in my hair before long. My eyes closed as I felt the stress melting away. Then, out of nowhere, I heard humming. A female voice just started humming. It was coming from inside the bathroom with me. I had the door closed, and I had not heard anyone come in. My blood ran cold. I froze. I couldn't breathe, and I felt like I was going to faint. I knew there was no one in that house but me. As I said, I repeatedly made sure all the windows and doors were locked. My brain tried to process what was happening. I thought maybe my aunt had come back early. No, that can't be right. That voice did not match hers. This wasn't a voice I recognized at all. The humming continued. It was a sad, haunting tune and I did not recognize the song. I stood there, frozen, too afraid to even peek or rinse the shampoo from my hair. After what felt like a minute, it stopped, and it got very quiet. I was still frozen in terror, and if it wasn't for my baby suddenly kicking, I swear I would have passed out. I felt his little kicks in my stomach, and it brought me out of my frozen state. 
I finally took some much needed deep breaths, realizing I hadn't been breathing. I also got the courage now to peek. I opened the shower curtain just a bit, and of course, nothing. There was nobody there. Then I saw someone pass by outside as a shadow passed through the opening at the bottom of the door. I thought, good, my aunt's finally back. I hurried to finish my shower and grabbed my towel. After I gathered the courage to leave the bathroom, I went out slowly, calling for my aunt. But I was met with silence. I looked around and saw nobody. By then I was shaking and afraid. After searching the entire house, finding nothing, I ran to the guest room and immediately called my husband to tell him what was going on. He believed me, thankfully, as he always has, and he stayed on the phone with me until I heard my aunt coming back. I also told her what happened. She was freaked out to hear this, but she wasn't too surprised, considering she apparently had her own experiences in that house as well. We had a lot of creepy experiences there, and this one just stuck with me. I've never heard the humming lady again, and I have no idea who she was or why she was humming to me in the bathroom. Part of me feared for my baby, hoping that's not why she came to hum that sad and haunting tune. I haven't been back to that house in a while, and my aunt has since moved out. My sister moved into there with her family. Now she has some scary experiences. I'm not really sure what's up with that place, but I feel like it might be the land itself. I'm glad I don't live there or go there too often nowadays, but I won't let it keep me from visiting my sister, though I do like to keep my visits brief. Man in the Top Hat from Noah D. This is a hard story for me to tell. It concerns my father and other members of my family, such as cousins, uncles, and aunts. My father was about 10 to 12 years old during this event. My family is quite large. Both my grandmother and grandfather on my father's side of the family had five other siblings. The family decided to host family events at my father's tiny house, until I was about three or four. Then we moved to another aunt's place for the rest of my life. As was tradition, all the children went into the attic, which had been converted into my father's room, while the adults stayed downstairs, chatting, reminiscing, and catching up with each other. As the children got increasingly bored and tried to stop the boredom, they came across a Ouija board in my father's room. It was given to my grandmother as a gift back in the 70s, when the kids grabbed the board, at first, they were doing the usual, are you there, or is there a ghost here, routine. Kids were pushing the object in the middle of the board, saying it was the ghost who did it. Really though, is there a presence here, said my cousin Mallory, who was then 11 years old. There was movement of the object, and it went over to the letters Y-E-S. Is anyone doing that? My dad asked. No, I'm not doing it, my cousin Ryan said. Honest. Well, if you're really there, move that cup, requested my Aunt Kelly. She pointed at a cup opposite of her, half filled with juice. As she finished her sentence, the cup began to slowly move across the floor without spilling. As it moved, everyone ran away from the Ouija board, scared, but they never did say goodbye to the spirit on the board. As for everyone downstairs, no one believed the kids' ghost stories. But my father and our cousins all believed it was a ghost. Following this incident, strange small happenings would occur in the house. They're very small and only worth mentioning to the fact that there were other spirits there, possibly. There was what we believed to be a family of spirits. A grandmother, a small boy and a small girl all seen in that house. One time, my aunt was lying down, and she saw a boy holding a small toy who walked over to her. By the time she sat up to say something, the boy was gone. 
Toys would randomly move to other locations. My father remembers being tucked in by an elderly lady that wasn't his grandmother. He didn't know who she was. On one occasion, my aunt was doing dishes. She thought she saw someone run towards the bathroom. My aunt, assuming it was my dad, yelled out for him, telling him to come help with the dishes. She turned to the bathroom and the door slammed shut. Now my aunt thought my dad was being cheeky. She started to knock on the door for him to come out. My aunt swears she was trying to get in there and was being held back by something, as if someone was holding the door on the other side. Suddenly, my dad walked down from his room, asking why she was acting so bizarre. When my aunt realized my real dad was behind her, she was finally able to open that door, but no one was in the bathroom. On a different occasion, my father was in the kitchen with one of his friends when they began to hear music. It sounded like jazz from the 1920s or something, coming from upstairs in his room. When he went upstairs to investigate, no one was there, and there was no sign of any people. Now, I've saved the worst story for last. It was 1999. My father was watching the Knicks in the finals. They lost. My dad said, screw this, and turned off the TV angrily then went to bed. At around 3 a.m., my dad woke up suddenly to sound coming from the TV. It sounded like static, but there were also voices behind it. My dad could hear people calling out. When he truly listened, he heard, My house, my house, my house. My dad looked up at the TV confused. That's when he saw him. He was standing where the TV was. A tall man, at least seven feet tall, wearing a black suit and a black top hat. His face was gray and sunken in almost like a skeleton. My father told me that there were no distinct red eyes like you would often hear in similar stories, just gray ones. The man stood behind the TV and off to the left of it. He just pointed at the TV set, like he was pointing at the voices, which kept saying, my house, my house, my house. My dad was terrified and quickly hid under a blanket for some kind of protection. Eventually, he pulled off the blanket to look again while the voices kept going. My dad was on his back at the time. What he saw then scared the life out of him. The top hat man was now mere inches away from his face, standing right above him. And the worst part about it was his smile. My dad said his smile was ear to ear, a smile so vile that only something like that evil entity could make. My dad, horrified again, put his head under the covers and stared at the alarm clock. My father stared at that clock for two hours straight listening to those words repeat, my house, my house, until finally my grandmother called for my dad. John? John, are you up for the fishing trip? My grandmother asked. She then flicked on the light switch. That's right, I've got a fishing trip today, my dad remembered. When the light turned on, my dad said that everything turned off and the TV stopped. The man was gone and out of sight, never to be seen in that house again. My dad didn't bring this up to anyone until he was well into adulthood. In his early 20s, my dad spoke with the cousins who had sat around that Ouija board that night. Before he finished explaining what the man looked like, my cousins stopped him. John, we've been seeing a man in a top hat circling our yard for years now. We don't know what it is at all. While this story is jumbled, and there are a lot of parts to it, there's a lesson to be learned about energy and what we put in and out into the world. When my mother was a few months pregnant, my dad realized I would be walking into my new grandparents' home, which was now infested with alleged entities, dark ones. He realized he never said goodbye using that Ouija board, too. 
Since we got rid of that Ouija board years ago, my dad thought of a different strategy. Using a tape recorder and a spirit tracker that he believed was fake online, he started to say goodbye to all the entities, and even said that he loved them and wished them safe travels in the afterlife. When he finished his recording, he played it back and swears he heard several different voices saying goodbye. He believes it was the elderly woman and two small children saying goodbye. These three spirits were believed to be in the house when the board was opened, but they were more active and my father was glad he got a response, ensuring their safety. The last voice he believes he heard, however, was more aggressive and demonic. All it said was, No! My dad had a pretty good idea of who that was, the man with the top hat. He recorded some more, giving more words of love and peace. My dad told me at that moment, my dad just wanted to be rid of that dark entity. He assumed that giving off positive energy would work. And it did. When my dad finally finished telling the top hat man his blissful goodbyes, he felt a sensation of relief. Which brings us to today. After I was born, according to him, I was too positive. Nothing's ever happened to me in that house. Not one little incident. My dad says I'm just a beacon of light, but I think that's bullcrap. I think it was all him. I think my dad saying goodbye and speaking to those spirits made the top hat man scoff and go away. During my lifetime, my dad searched for possible causes of spirits entering the home. My dad eventually discovered a fire had taken place on the property in the early 20th century, killing an elderly woman and two children. My dad and I were told by my grandfather that a man even hung himself on a tree on the property. Maybe that was the cause for the manifestation of the top hat man. Maybe he was the man that killed himself. We'll never really know until we die ourselves, I guess, but it's something to think about, right? In the end, it's my belief that my dad opened a Ouija board and forgot to close it, bringing in four entities three friendly ones who had died on the property and were at most mischievous, and a dark entity that gave off the appearance of a man in a top hat. But thanks to my dad, they're all gone now, peacefully ending the haunting in my grandparents' home. A Little Christmas Shopping From Red Scarecrow 99 I have had a plethora of unexplained encounters with various things in my life. I'm in my mid-thirties and spend most of my life outdoors in the warmer months. The same could be said in my teen years, which is when this happened. It was close to this time of the year, but I was 16 then. It happened on a particular weekend, one which I was excited for, for a week or so. My cousin was coming over, we'll call him Jay. He was my mother's nephew and a few years older than me. At the time, Jay was 19 or 20. He was coming to spend the weekend with us and I was pumped. He even brought his Doom game for the PlayStation and I had just bought a cheat code magazine. That's right, it was back in the early 2000s, back when you had to buy a magazine for cheat codes. But that's not the creepy part of the story. Jay and I were determined to get through all 666 levels in a single session. We had all the required supplies, two bags of chips, a case of Mountain Dew, and even some hoagies for dinner. My parents were going out for Christmas shopping, so we were in charge of my younger brother, who we'll call A. He was about seven years old at the time. The night was going great. It was a quiet Friday night, and school had been cancelled after a typical Pennsylvania snow squall dumped five inches of the powdery stuff out of nowhere. We had just finished our hoagies, and our parents had just left the driveway. Darkness fell as the Pennsylvania nights come quick in December. Really, it was the perfect night. By the time we'd been playing for about two hours, we heard what sounded like footsteps in the attic. We figured my parents were stashing away their first haul, and we tried to keep A's attention on the game. A was a tad spooked, 
but it wasn't something we should be alarmed about. After all, those could be our gifts too up there. The noises continued for about 20 minutes off and on. Eventually, I decided to get some water, my teenage way of snooping to catch a glimpse of Santa's sack. Funny thing was, my parents' car wasn't in the driveway, but there were still noises upstairs. I called Jay. He was a significantly larger guy. Jay was about 6 foot 5, 300 pounds back then, so he was voluntold to check the attic. It was like the opening of E.T., when the teenagers grab knives and exclaim about checking it out. The attic was quiet, dark, and to our surprise, locked and empty. Now, this wasn't the first time paranormal events transpired in this house. The house was so active, I got in trouble because I was accused of leaving the basement door open every morning before school. It got to the point my no-nonsense father installed a hook and latch on the door to keep it from opening. We decided to head back to the game and keep quiet. No need to get A worked up, since he was playing his turn on Doom, and thanks to God mode, wasn't dying and was having a blast. We took our posts in my bedroom and relaxed for a brief period, before the house decided it was time for round two. I heard noises coming from the basement door. I'd had enough, and announced I'd be letting out Jericho, our pit bull, to use the bathroom. I went to the kitchen to let him out back for a change. The basement door there was wide open. I think I grumbled and shut it. I wasn't keen on getting grounded for this. As I let the dog out, I noticed footprints leading from the woods out back, going up to our porch, then around the house. I left the dog out, but his attention went immediately to the roof. I followed his gaze and thought I saw someone or something duck down on the other side of the roof. Nope, I thought. Not today. Did not want to see that. We ran back inside, and I told everything to my cousin. The two of us didn't have cell phones. They were much less common back then. We couldn't really afford them anyway. They were more of luxury items than commonplace in those parts. So calling my parents wasn't an option. We did what any normal young men would do. Lacking common sense, we grabbed our favorite boomsticks with our hunting walkie-talkies and locked A in the bedroom with the dog. In our defense, we thought someone was trying to break in. The house was mostly dark from our gaming session, and we figured we could easily handle this ourselves. So out into the night we went. Jay and I spotted a figure duck down on the other side of the roof as we went out the back door. We turned on the walkie-talkies and circled the one-story ranch as quietly as possible. Only, we didn't see anything other than some footprints. We figured we were playing a game of tag with the culprit, and they simply went to the other side. Our suspicious intruder was caught peeling over the crest of the roof, but we couldn't make anything out other than the head that appeared to be just a shadow. Jay quickly ran around the other side at one point, but not before leaning in to whisper, Stay here. I'll talk loud and circle around. You hide behind the oak tree in the yard. I'll radio you when I'm in the back. Our friend should pop back over, and once you level that 16 gauge, the game is over, and we can call the cops. That was the plan. I know, not exactly foolproof, but he claimed to know everything at 16 years old. So off Jay went, fake talking to me loudly as he went around, and I hid behind a tree. This is where it got interesting. My radio squawked to life. Do you see him? Jay called. No, I whispered, now that my position was given away. The radio crackled. He just went over the roof to your side. My blood ran cold. I never took my gaze off the house. It was like our burglar had just disappeared. I called Jay back, and we went inside to check on A. A was in hysterics. He said that the doorknob had jiggled, and that Jericho, the dog, had ran to the door and began to growl. Three minutes later, we knocked on the door, telling him to open up. We didn't tell A what happened to us. We said that we had seen Santa instead, and because we moved since last Christmas, 
Santa was just making sure he had the right address. That was a bold-faced lie, but we weren't sure when my parents would get home. As if on cue, we heard my father's pickup pull into the garage. The next day, we got my dad one-on-one. -on -one. Well, more like two-on-one. -on -one. Jay and I described what happened, and the footprints were still visible on the roof. But my dad dismissed it, like usual. Uh, probably a raccoon or something. That's definitely one of my favorite lines he uses to downplay something unexplainable in the woods. We never did get a clear look at what it was, but that house was generous in spooky events. I swear I saw a little person out back, watching from the trees, and I didn't know what significance it had at the time, just being a kid from the sticks, but I saw a black coyote watching from the woods out back a week later. It was rather large and wasn't afraid of me and my dog. It ran off into the woods and stopped, looking back as if it wanted us to follow. We obviously didn't. Next year, however, we all got cell phones before Christmas and ended up moving. Needless to say, we never had any more interesting Christmas shopping stories after that. The Red Crayon from Anonymous Viewer PH22 This happened to me when I was just seven years old. It was about 1 p.m. My mom had left me alone in our house to visit my aunt, who doesn't live too far away from us. I remembered setting up my little table in front of a small cabinet with glass doors, the ones that you must push first in order for it to open, and as a kid, I had a really hard time opening it so I always needed someone to open it for me. After setting up my table, coloring books, and crayons, I began to color a page. I remembered using a red crayon when I felt a need to pee, so I got up, left the red crayon on the table beside my coloring book, and went to the bathroom. When I came back to continue coloring, the red crayon that I was using just before I went to the bathroom was nowhere to be found. I clearly remembered that I left it on the table just beside the coloring book, so I was quite confused at the time. Just then, my eye caught something inside the glass doors of the cabinet beside the table. It was the red crayon. I furrowed my brow as I thought of any possible explanation to what must have happened. I was very much alone in the house, and I even locked all the doors after my mom left, so being a little kid, I really just shrugged it off. My only problem that moment was that I could not open the glass cabinet without the help of an adult, so I left the house to go to my grandma's place just across the street. I saw my grandpa in the garden, so I told him that I needed some help with the cabinet because I couldn't open it myself. So we went inside the house and I led him to the cabinet. When we returned to the table, what I saw sent chills down my whole body. The red crayon that was supposed to be inside that cabinet was now exactly where I'd left it before. I felt really scared, and I even started to cry. My poor grandfather was very confused, so I told him everything after I calmed down. My family believes in the paranormal, so unsurprisingly, he believed me. Granddad told me to just go to their house so that I wouldn't be left alone in our house. I agreed. Nothing unnatural was experienced in the house after that, except for the feeling of being watched every now and then when you're alone. I still feel chills every time I remember that story from my childhood. In fact, I recall never using that red crayon again. House on the Farm From Reagan Going back to 2019, I had to move out of my childhood home due to money issues. It took my parents well over two months to find a house for us to rent. Lucky enough, a week before we had to move, my dad found a place only a few streets down. The house was a two-story home that sat on the very edge of a popular horse farm. We moved in, and surprisingly, everything felt okay from the first night we moved in, up until a few days later. There were two bathrooms in the home, one upstairs and one downstairs. For the first few days, I used the upstairs shower, 
seeing as my mom had not yet purchased a curtain for the downstairs shower. When she finally did, I decided to shower downstairs. While rinsing my hair and closing my eyes, I had one of the most terrifying feelings come over my entire body. I felt nausea, chills, instant goosebumps, and a sudden pounding headache. I quickly rinsed my hair out and opened my eyes. The second I did, the feeling lifted and was gone just as fast as it arose. However, when I opened the shower curtain, the towels that were there on the shelf were now on the floor. It was odd, I will admit, but at the time, I just blamed the whole situation on being in a new place. As for the towels, maybe it was the cat. Everything was calm for a long time. The towels would continue to fall on the floor, but I would just blame the cat. Fast forward about a month, a close friend of mine texted me very early in the morning. He asked if the house I moved into was the one on the farm. I responded with yes, expecting him to want to stop by after school to check the place out. But I was never prepared for what he said next. He proceeded to tell me a story about the place that his friend shared with him. She used to do horseback riding at the barn. He explained that the home was haunted. After so much time of being at the barn, she refused to even go at night due to the strange things she would encounter there. Now, I don't remember exactly how her story went, but I do remember being absolutely horrified afterwards. After hearing this story, I decided to look into the house to see what I could find about the property, which had been standing there since the late 1800s. It took me a few days, but I finally came across a website called Ghosts of America. I started to read, seeing as the website was kind of sketchy looking, if you ask me. Sure enough, I found my house and the exact property, and there was a submission from none other than a man named Dave, who, believe it or not, was our landlord. As I read down the article, it talked about how there was an apparent suicide in the home, and there were feelings of being watched, especially in the shower. Figures were often spotted in the first floor bathroom, and some believed the most haunted room in the home was the master bedroom. The one thing that stood out to me most was they had mentioned there were tunnels in the basement. So I sent in a response with a small sliver of hope that whoever had posted this would check back and give me a response. I then went to check out the basement. I walked down there for the first time, expecting to see small tunnels made by rodents or other animals. But I couldn't have been more wrong. I shone my light to the back of the basement, revealing a hole in the wall about three feet off the ground. It looked to be about three feet by four feet in width and length, easily big enough for a person to fit through, but I refused to go any farther. One night, I was sitting in my room, and my bed faced four big closet doors. As I was drifting off to sleep, I could hear the closet doors creaking. So, I sat up, curiously, to see what was going on. And in that moment, I watched all four doors open individually and close. Needless to say, I never slept in my room alone again. From that point forward, I slept downstairs on the couch. Time went by. Before long, we'd lived there for about a year. I was sitting up, sick, and I got that same feeling like I did that night in the shower. I started to look around nervously, and I could have sworn I saw someone at least six feet tall standing in the bathroom doorframe. I'd never been more terrified. Finally, it was time to move. We packed up all of our things, and on the last night, before leaving for the last time, myself, a close friend, and my parents were sitting on boxes in what was the dining room, eating some dinner. When I decided to bring up the incident of the figure in the bathroom, and I'm glad I finally did, my friend Alex looked at me and said in a shaky voice, I saw it too. I looked up in such shock and listened. He told me on one of the nights he spent the night on the couch, he woke up around 3 a.m. 
My mom, my dad, and I were gone due to a family emergency, and Alex was trusted enough to be there alone. It was then that he saw a figure in the doorway. Not knowing that we were gone, he said out loud, Real funny. But when there was no response, he started to get nervous. That's when he grabbed his phone and quickly turned on the flashlight. He noticed the text from me saying that we had all left. By the time he looked back up, the figure had vanished without a sound. My dad then chimed in, saying he had seen it too. I'd never been more happy to leave for good that night. After moving and settling in with my grandmother, I was on my phone when I watched an email come through from someone anonymous. Once again, I never could have prepared myself for what I was about to read. This person stated that years back, they were sitting in their home directly across the street when they saw an abnormal amount of apparitions surrounding the home, but couldn't figure out what had happened. The following day, they went over to see what had happened, and they were told two lives had been taken in the home the night before. A father hung himself from the balcony in the kitchen, and the son followed suit on the balcony on the stairwell. The case never released in the papers, nor on the news. I still get chills driving by that house to this very day, and I hope I never have to go back. The Woman in My Room From Random Account 342 When I was around seven years old, my parents and I moved into a rental house after selling our previous house. Prior to this incident, I hadn't heard of the previous owner at all and had no relation to her. One day, I believe it was a weekend, I woke up around 7 a.m. This wasn't out of the ordinary. I typically woke up early as a kid. I slept in this tent-like bed cover since I used to be terrified of the dark back then and having that extra layer of security made me feel safer. I unzipped it as normal but when I climbed out, I suddenly saw a woman, a woman I didn't recognize. This woman was not transparent. In fact, she looked as clear as day and was standing right outside my closet doors. She looked to be older, probably in her mid to late 80s. She even had a walker. I don't remember the exact details of her face, but I believe her hair was pulled back and she was sort of just bent over on her walker. She also had a very stern expression on her face, almost as if she was angry at something. I was, of course, frightened by her, and immediately ran to my parents' room, explaining what I had just seen. My dad isn't exactly a believer in anything of the supernatural variety, so he was a bit skeptical. I mean, I don't blame him. I was a seven-year-old kid with a vivid imagination. But my mom was a believer of the paranormal, and still is. After hearing my account, she contacted the landlord and explained what I'd seen to him. The woman I described matched the description of the old lady who previously rented the place. She had died not too long ago. After this event... I never noticed or saw the woman in my room again. I don't have many theories on the matter. My only one would be that she hadn't realized she passed away yet and was angry that I and my parents were now in her house. However, one detail still stands out to me. When people explain or give details about ghosts, they typically describe them as transparent or white in color. One thing I can say for sure is that this old woman was as clear as day. She looked as real as you and I. She wasn't transparent or anything of the sort. I haven't since experienced many paranormal encounters after this event. However, I still believe I saw something incredibly strange that day. House of Renters From Medzi when I was eight years old, my family rented a house for two years 
while my childhood home was being constructed. When we first moved in, I noticed I had an uneasy feeling. It was like I was being watched constantly. I tried to ignore those feelings. I was young and figured it was just because of the new environment. I believed I would get used to it as time went on. My first night there, I remember lying awake in bed, staring up at the ceiling. As I lay there, trying to find shapes in the popcorn ceiling, I heard a rattling noise coming from my closet. I sat up to see that the latch that held the door shut was jiggling, and as the seconds went by, it became more intense. Finally, after about a minute, the closet door steadily opened about halfway. Scared but curious, I got out of bed and investigated. There was nothing in or around the closet. Eventually, I went back to bed, trying to forget about the whole thing. Unfortunately, that was easier said than done, because every night around the same time, history would repeat itself. I became so accustomed to it that it was just part of my bedtime routine. The next time I noticed something off about the house was when I was spending time with my father in his office. His office was the only other room upstairs, and it was at the opposite end of the hallway across from my room. I loved spending time up there, and for some reason, I always felt so safe in there. I would ask to sleep in there on a blow-up mattress and took every opportunity I could to have sleepovers in the office. One day in the middle of a hot summer, I remember being in there with my father. We didn't have air conditioning, but there was a fan. All of a sudden, the room became unbelievably cold. My father and I looked at each other, and when my father started to speak, we could see his breath. Both of us just stared in confusion. Then as quickly as it started, it stopped, and the temperature went back to normal. It was as if a switch had been flicked on and off. This happened another handful of times over the two years we lived there. I'm not sure who or what was in that room, but I always felt as if they were trying to protect me. The basement was a different story. It was dark and damp and gave off this uneasy feeling. I went down there only a handful of times because I just felt so unsafe down there. It was weird, because in different rooms and parts of the house, I would feel different sensations. But the basement, it was the danger zone. My room and the common areas, such as the kitchen and living room, were more neutral, and the upstairs office was a safe space. As I look back on all this now, I believe the house was filled with different entities, I know my parents always felt something was off in the house, but none of us actually spoke about it or acknowledged any of it. That was until the day that we could no longer ignore it. To get into our house, we had a side door that led to a mudroom. This mudroom was a small, maybe 5x5 five five space with another heavy door that led into the kitchen. One day, my mother and I came back home from a grocery shopping trip. I helped carry the bags inside with her. We entered the mudroom, and I closed the door behind us. But as we entered the kitchen, I left the mudroom door open. We put all the groceries away and got settled. I went to head upstairs to my room to play when my mother called for me. She yelled at me to close the mudroom door, because it was my responsibility, as I had been the last one to enter the house. My mother was facing the door, and I turned around to close it. I took one step towards it, and it slammed shut on its own. I was still a good five feet away from it. There was no way my tiny little arms could have reached it from that far. I turned to see my mother quickly. My face held an expression of fear, as I thought I was going to be blamed for the door slamming shut. Thankfully, my mother had been facing me and the door when it happened. She watched it all unfold. The two of us were stunned for about a minute, standing there staring at each other in silence. 
The door beyond it, which led outside, was a heavy-duty door which was closed and locked, so there were no drafts, no other explanations as to how this door could have slammed shut with such force. Being a sarcastic eight-year-old, I simply said, uh, Thanks, ghost, and I trotted upstairs to my bedroom. It was the first time that any of us spoke about the unexplained events out loud and to each other. We eventually moved out and into the home I grew up in. Although it was a brief moment in my childhood, I will never forget the time we spent in that house with the other renters who were apparently living there with us. Ghost Dog From Skittle McDiddle in 2022, we had to put down our dog, Mocha. Mocha was a chocolate lab with a mix that we are unaware of. When she died, she was really skinny. In 2020, we discovered she had cancer, and Mocha had survived until late November of 2022. We put her down inside the house, specifically by the couch in the living room. When she would go to sleep, she always slept in my parents' room, the night she died, we were all sad as anyone would be. The following night, and for the next few days, I would just feel really sad when I walked by her death spot. Fast forward to about a month later, we were renovating the house. In the other room, there was a board, which was held against the wall so there was no way it would fall down, and there was no wind anywhere. But as we were renovating, we hear that board fall over. We went to check, and sure enough, there it was. It looked as if a dog had walked past and knocked it over. At the time, we had no other pets other than chickens outdoors. About seven months later, we got our cat Homer. And about a month after that, in the middle of the night, my parents heard the sound of our dog walking around because she would walk around so much during the night. On the hardwood floor, they could hear the clacking sound of Mocha's paws walking about, and in the morning, my mom was cleaning the bed when she noticed a dirty dog paw. Our cat Homer was not in their bedroom at all that night, and that paw was far too big to be from our cat Homer. Something tells me that Mocha is still around. Black Licorice From Strange One Love I've had, throughout my life, Paranoid or paranormal occurrences. I've always believed mirrors to be powerful objects, and they're where most of my situations have happened. This one story in particular took place when I was in grade 5 or 6, so maybe around 2002. I've always tried being friendly with everyone, and of course some people take advantage of that. Some girls in my class dared me to join them in the changing room of the gym, to play Candyman. Nowadays, I've learned more of the game and don't believe we did it how the story supposedly goes. But nonetheless, there we were. I'll refer to these girls as J, R, and T. R was actually my bully, but J and T were nice to me whenever R wasn't around. So when they invited me, I had no idea what was in store, but I knew I wanted these girls to like me since I disliked being excluded and wanted R to like me, instead of picking on me. So we were in the changing room. There were a few lockers and wooden benches, and a single toilet stall and sink in the corner. At this sink was a mirror that they decided was best to summon the Candyman with, by exclaiming, Candyman, Candyman, please give me some candy, with both hands cupped together with our eyes closed. By doing this, they told me I would feel like candy was placed in my hands, or he would kill me. You know, just your usual childhood spooky bathroom stories, like Bloody Mary and the like. R, T, and me were in front of the mirror, and J stood at the side of the mirror to reach the light switch on the back of the wall with the mirror. When J turned out the lights, the rest of us began to chant, Candyman. Candyman, please give me some candy. I felt a chill, and as I was startled, I opened my eyes. Instead of seeing Jay beside the mirror in the dark, 
I swear I saw a black licorice cat with glasses. I screamed and dropped to the floor. Jay turned on the lights, and everything went back to normal. Now, I know kids can have a strange sense of hyperactive imagination, but I can still see it when I recall the memory. And now, years later, I've tried researching anything to explain why I saw a black licorice cat of all things sitting on the counter, but nothing comes up. This doesn't even follow the normal Candyman lore. If anyone has any idea what that might symbolize, please let me know. Something Dark in My Childhood Home From Vanna0416 When I was 10 years old, I was living in the backwoods area of East Tennessee. As a kid, I loved the quiet area and being able to play in the woods with my siblings. My grandparents lived right down the hill from us, and some of my best memories were from helping them out around the property. As much as I loved the place, times were not always good. I won't go into detail about some of it, because some things aren't so good to remember. I just think that they may have played a role in creating the negative energy, or happened due to the negative energy already there. At the time, we lived in a brand new trailer that my grandparents had paid for right on the lot and had moved onto the property. The following are three experiences I want to share. There were more, but these three stuck with me the most and still cause a lot of issues, especially fear of the dark. This first one occurred not too long after we moved in. It was getting towards bedtime, so my mom told me to grab one of my nightgowns from her room. It was in a box that hadn't been unpacked yet. My dad was already in there sleeping, and I didn't want to wake him up, so instead of turning on their light, I just left the door open so I could see. In their room, they had an attached bathroom. The box I needed to get into was behind the bathroom door, which was open. Right after getting the box open, I remember going still, and I felt a massive presence behind me. I knew it wasn't my dad, because currently, he was still snoring. I turned just enough to see a giant black shadowy mass standing behind me. I felt so terrified, so helpless. I couldn't scream, I couldn't move. At least, until I noticed their door was now slowly starting to shut. I don't know if it was pure terror at the thought of being in the complete dark with this thing, but I suddenly turned and took off running out of their room. I don't recall my mom ever asking why I never got the nightgown, but I didn't say anything about the shadow. The second experience wasn't as scary, but it left me feeling like there was something more to it. My older brother and sister were playing in the woods. I was starting to fall a bit behind them, but they were still close enough that I could see them and hear them talking. As I walked, suddenly what I thought was a hand was planted right on my shoulder. Once again, I felt paralyzed. I mustered up the courage and looked to where I felt the hand. It wasn't a hand after all. What was on my shoulder was a tree branch, but the branch had five little finger-like twigs connected to the bottom of it, making it feel exactly like a hand. I mean, I could swear I even felt pressure on my shoulder like someone gripping a bit more firmly when it first landed. It felt like someone had squeezed my shoulder. I was able to simply brush this off, and I quickly caught up to my siblings. And for my last story, the moment that changed my view on how the world works forever, the thing that caused me intense curiosity and fear about the paranormal. I was sitting on the couch with my dad, watching TV, and for some reason, at that same exact time, we both turned around and looked at the spot above his bedroom door. There it was, a massive black thing stretched across the whole top of the doorframe. As a kid, this thing was huge. It looked like it was just lying across the wall. It had six legs, three on either side of its body. Its legs I can only describe as being like lines that went straight out 
then curved like an uppercase L. It had these deep red eyes that were just staring back at us. After staring at it for so long, my dad and I looked at each other and just went back to watching TV. We never said anything to each other until just a couple of years ago. At the age of 26, I asked him if he remembered seeing it. He admitted that he did, except he described the legs as more like tentacles. Another thing to mention, one of my brothers suffered from nightmares about demon dogs with red eyes going after our mom, but he would always wake up before they got to her. I also had recurring nightmares about black hands coming out of the walls or from under my bed, trying to grab me. It's been years since all of this happened, and I still want to know what it all was. If anyone has any idea, feel free to speak your suggestions. Thank you for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoy this show, think about supporting us. There are several ways you can. Search for EerieCast on your favorite podcast app and follow our other scary shows, especially the other two I host, Tales from the Break Room and Camping Horrors. Leave Unexplained Encounters a rating on Spotify and a review on Apple Podcasts. The more we get, the higher we climb in the charts. Get some cool merch at EerieCast.store or unlock tons of cool extras like exclusive audiobooks and music tracks Add free access to all our shows and a huge 20% discount on all our merch, all for less than three bucks a month by signing up for EerieCast Plus at EerieCast.com slash plus. Thank you. Until next time, send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org so I can narrate them in a future episode. And follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Dark Prevails for plenty of screams and memes. Stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.